You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the narrow mind. Tuesday night, March 21st, 2006. My name is Gene Cook. Welcome to the Narrow Mind Broadcast. We're going to be talking about the subject of dispensationalism again tonight. We've been dedicating the last several programs to the subject of dispensationalism. And uh, we're going to be talking about the aspect of dispensationalism that has to do with the rebuilt temple. And so I want to begin by asking the question, does the Bible teach that there will be a rebuilt temple? Our phone number is 1-800-466-1873. I am inviting you to uh, get involved in the dialogue here tonight. That is 1-800-466-1873. That's toll-free. And uh, what do you think? Let me, let me begin by reading a quote for you. It says, quote, But we do know that the temple will be rebuilt. Paul, John, and our Lord all make reference to the temple in events immediately preceding Christ's second coming. And the preparations have begun. The major components are moving into place for the final countdown. Have you done your homework? End quote. Uh, that was our friend Chuck Misler. Now, Chuck Misler uh, runs a ministry that claims to be the source for Christian intelligence. And he gives out uh, what he calls K-rations. At least he did at the time that I... I did some research on this. Uh, you'll find up-to-date information on biblical relevance of current events, plus a verse-by-verse Bible study each and every week, according to uh, the old uh, website there of Chuck Misler. John MacArthur Jr., who uh, I often speak highly of, but yet disagree with him on this particular issue, says, quote, Jesus clearly was looking toward a yet future abomination of desolation. Some suggest that this prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70 when Titus invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. However, the Apostle Paul saw a still future fulfillment when the Antichrist sets up an image in the temple during the future tribulation. Christ's words here, therefore, look beyond the events of 70 AD to a time of greater global cataclysm that will immediately precede his coming. Steve Roden writes, Quote, spurred by religious belief and nationalistic fervor and backed by the government, a group of Israelis and Jews abroad, uh, I guess Israelis and Jews abroad, are quietly planning the construction of the third Jewish temple. So it's a, it's a, it's a well-known fact that dispensationalism teaches that there is going to be a rebuilt temple. And so I'd like to know what you think. Does the Bible teach that... Uh, Does the Bible teach that there's going to be a rebuilt temple? Does the Bible tell us that uh, they're going to move the mosque that's on the Dome of the Rock and rebuild the temple in Israel? Is that how you understand the Bible? If it is, I'd like you to uh, give me a call. I'd like to discuss that with you. Our number, once again, is 1-800-466-1873. That is 1-800-466-1873. 466-1873. And uh, we need to apologize to our friend uh, Robert, who uh, got disconnected. Robert, if you call back, uh, we'll be sure and get you on this time. So that's the question for tonight. Uh, is there going to be a rebuilt temple? What does the Bible teach about a rebuilt temple? Well, hopefully you've got a copy of the scriptures and we can open them up. And take a look. All right, uh, let's take a look first at uh, what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 10 through 14. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, By what will we have been sanctified through? I'm sorry, 
Let me back up. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which he can which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. For by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So uh, here we see that the one offering, the sacrifice has been made in the person of Jesus Christ, and uh, there's really no more need for a sacrificial system for an offering. It says in verse 12, But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So uh, it appears it appears that there is uh, no more need for a temple because remember the temple was the place where the sacrifices were um, executed, where the sacrifice was carried out and where all of the temple uh, accoutrements of the Old Testament were found. All right, let's go to our first caller, Anthony calling from uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Anthony, welcome to the Narrow Mind. Hey, Pastor Gene. How are you? Hey, I was. I'm doing pretty good. I was wanting to talk to you. Um, it's sort of about this topic, but there's something I hear consistently from, um, I guess, who aren't dispensational or premillennials. They keep talking about how it was. It's a recent idea, and to me, that's just well less than truthful. Um, there's hundreds of, of premillennialists who had at least um, versions of dispensationalism long before Darby or Schofield. I mean, I could give you names. Um, Johan Alstead, 1568. Uh, William Twist, 1575. Uh, in fact, if you read... You what read was that, it that those... What, I'm, I'm sorry, Anthony. What was it that those men actually taught? Well, they taught um, a separation between Israel and the Church, which is not as clearly defined, or, and, not, and not the same way as, say, uh, Schofield or Darby, but it, it's my understanding and my belief that dispensationalism is an outgrowth of believing in a little millennium once you consistently kind of follow that path. Now, these guys were dispensationalists, not in the same sense that uh, uh, Darby was, but they were. And just like dispensationalists don't characterize every letter of every amillennialist, you can't say it's a new idea. Now, Darbyism might be, but dispensational premillennialism is not. And let me give you a quote here. Um, again, kind of going on the idea that, uh, that, that dispensation, dispensationalism is an outgrowth of premillennialism. Um, uh, Philip Schaff from the History of Christian Church, Volume 2, uh, page 614. The most striking point in the eschatology of the anti nazian age is the prominent Chileism or millenarianism, Philip Schaff. And if you've ever read um, Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo, he makes these distinctions, not as clear as probably a dispensationist would like, but he does make the distinctions. Um, okay, when, when we talk about dispensationalism being a new development, we're talking about certain aspects that set it apart from historic premillennialism. For example, a secret rapture a future seven-year tribulation, a rebuilt temple, an unforeseen uh, dispensation known as the dispensation of the church that was unforeseen in the Old Testament, the concept that uh, the kingdom was offered to Israel, and if they had taken it at the time of Christ's first coming, there wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Those are elements that were introduced and in, that, that, that really set apart dispensationalism from historic premillennialism. Okay, but it was taught before... What was taught? Um, I, I understand so historic so premillennialism has been taught f for a long time. Uh, and it's perfectly acceptable. I mean, uh, I, dispensationalism is acceptable too, don't get me wrong. It, when I say acceptable, I mean within the pale of orthodoxy. But um, I don't find... I, I've had people send me quotes from these guys that say that dispensationalism was around before uh, Darby, but they don't teach any of the tenets 
or at least I haven't been able to find any of the tenets that I just mentioned, the, the main ones that set dispensationalism apart from premillennialism. Okay, well, I mean, I'll send you some stuff I don't, uh, from from Justin Martyr, but let me let me say this: you can't go back and read uh, um, Augustine and find certain aspects, um, all aspects of the five points of Calvinism. There, um, he would have probably had you and I burned at the stake, possibly for uh, you know being Baptist. I mean, it. it, it and that's getting off the subject, but I, what happens is, is people who are non-dispensational, and it usually ends up, it starts at being non-premillennial, because I believe that's where it's an outgrowth of. And see, just as the doctrine um, of Calvinism developed and was more refined, you know, maybe also um, the doctrine of dispensationalism, which everyone believes in, in some sense, also has. Now, I'm not, I don't believe... In the same way Darby did, but there was men like Robert Govet who believed in two stages of the kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that's going on right now, um, and then a literal fulfillment of all those things you just said um, in, in the coming kingdom. The problem I have, I keep hearing this from people like James Wise, well, you know, no one believed this way until, um, no. No, people did believe. They just didn't have every single thing the exact way Darby did. Schofield disagreed with Darby on certain things. Ryrie disagrees with Schofield. I mean, it's just an unfair way to characterize it. So, Amillennialism was never taught until maybe uh, Origen or, or, but definitely not, not to Augustine. I mean, you, we could claim, hey, no one even spoke the word until, uh, you know, 400. So it's just it's an unfair characterization. Well, I suppose then the final, the final court of appeal is the scripture, right? I mean, ultimately, church history can only, uh, you know, can only validate or not not even sure. validate, but uh, complement uh, what we believe the Bible is saying. It's certainly helpful if we have a long history of certain beliefs. But concerning the subject of the rebuilt temple, Anthony, do you believe that there's going to be a rebuilt temple? Absolutely. I think that, um, well, I think it's being rebuilt right now. I'm talking um, about in the Scripture. I mean, anybody can rebuild the temple. I'm talking about, does the Scripture uh, discuss a future rebuilt temple? Yes, I think that, um, and let me just back up just a second. If you had read, um, and you may have, um, people 16th century, 17th century, talk about a Israel becoming a nation again, not the way you're going to argue against it by saying, well, it's not the Israel that it was then. Just the idea that it would be a country again. They mocked it. They laughed at it. This is impossible. And yet we see God brought it together. He's doing exactly what... How do you know God brought it together? I mean, where did God say he was going to uh, bring a bunch of atheist Jews together and uh, make a nation out of them? Where does the Bible teach that? Well, believing that that uh, you know Christ is going to reign in Jerusalem over his people and the promises are still made to um, to the Jew um, that's yep. that's the outgrowth of that so we would say that um, the uh, I'm getting confused here the temple has to be rebuilt to be destroyed um, the Jews have to what the be temple already was destroyed though well, the temple's already been destroyed so why does it have to be rebuilt and destroyed again if it was already destroyed? Well, remember, the Bible says that Elijah, Jesus said um, Elijah came, but then he said, and he was John the Baptist, but then he said he still had to come. I mean, there's these, there's these double applications. And as we sit back and we go, okay, it's at least within the pale of orthodoxy to believe in a form of dispensationalism. And watching God work, I tremble at the thought of someone going, you know, Satan's bound right now. I don't know if you're all millennialist. Um, I am. I, okay. Um, and I don't know exactly, you know, every point of that, but, you know, if you've ever read uh, Charles Spurgeon's take on that, I wholly agree with him. Um, I, I'd like to read you a quote. Um, now, this is specifically an allegorical interpretation of Revelation 20, and you may not hold exactly to what he says, um, that he's responding to, but he says, I once had the misfortune to listen to an excellent friend of mine 
who was preaching on this text. I must confess I did not attend with very great patience to his exposition. He said it meant blessed and holy is he who has been born again, who has been regenerated, and so has had a resurrection from dead works by the resurrection of Christ. I mean, he recognized the problem. Actually, Spurgeon signed a, uh, a premillennial um, belief, a doctrinal statement. Um, I can even show you in the sword and trial where he did that. And that doesn't mean anything. We're back to the scriptures. Um, could God keep his promises to the Jew? Could he? Well, we believe that he could, and most... Well, he does. It's not could he. If he makes a promise, he's good for it. That's the bottom line. If God promises something, it's not a matter of could he or will he. He does. And the promises are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. That's what the scriptures teach. So all of the promises... As we back up and go, Christ said, you know, he's going to reign. He is reigning. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. You believe that, don't you? Of course, but we do, we believe that the Son of Man is going to come and reign from, from from Jerusalem. And as we look at this, why? We go, why? Where does it say that in Scripture? Where does it say that He's going to come and reign from Jerusalem? Well, the throne of the King of David. I guess it doesn't specifically say Jerusalem. It says in Acts yeah. chapter two that David was looking forward to the resurrection when he spoke of Him sitting on being seated on His throne. He's reigning <laughs> from David's throne right now. Again, you have to understand that many dispensationalists believe in a twofold reign, a spiritual one now and a literal one during the millennium. I understand that, that but my question is why? Because it was promised. Wh- where? We, believe, we believe that the promises hold a, a um, spiritual fulfillment and a literal fulfillment. Where the is temple- it promised that Jesus is going to reign from an earthly throne? It doesn't. It, it, it's just not there. It says, it says in Isaiah ch- chapter 9, verse 6, that a child would be born, and from that time forward, the government would rest upon his shoulders. And so we... If you look at Isaiah chapter 6, you see a double interpretation now also. I mean... If Jesus um, is Lord of Lords and King of Kings... Absolutely. Then there's no... He, he's reigning. I mean, he's, he's got the highest position of authority. He's already reigning even over the king's of this land, of this world. I mean, there is no well, higher... He, I mean, wasn't he reigning even before he came to earth? I mean, he was God. I mean, he was sovereign over earth. I mean... He was, but not not in the sense of being the second Adam. He comes and redeems the creation. And that's why it's necessary for, necessary for him to take on um, the flesh of Adam to take back, to reverse the uh, the curse, to reverse the effects of the curse that Adam brought upon us and therefore, he now reigns as a son of David, which is what the Old Testament promised. So, I, I, Anthony, I can. I, I used to be a dispensationalist, and so, but I, I, at some point, I got to ask myself the question: Why do I believe this? Where is this in Scripture? And quite honestly, Anthony, the reason why I changed is not because I abandoned premillennialism; it's because I just didn't see it in Scripture anymore. Okay, that's fair. The last thing I'll just say is that you know the main reason I called was I think it's mischaracterized and it's unfair when people are arguing. And I think it's uns- where does it say? Okay, explain to me. I could say the same thing to you. How in the world is is the devil bound? I mean, you know, it says in Revelation chapter twenty, it's so that he has no, so that he doesn't have full control over the nations. It doesn't say that. Oh well, yes, it does. It's <laughs> in the Old Testament, God primarily worked with Israel. In the New Testament, the gospel goes out from Israel to Samaria to the nations. The New Testament authors are are uh, preoccupied with uh, the reigning in of the nations, which is happening. That's what the Jerusalem Council is about. That's what the book of Galatians is about. It's about the uh, the place of Gentiles. It says in, in verse 3, uh, t- chapter 20, verse 3, and threw him into the abyss, that is Satan, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. And so the sense in which he's, Satan is bound is that he's not given free reign over the nations. God is calling the elect from among the nations. That's how you and I both became Christians. So that's okay. the sense in which he's bound. He's still active on earth, there's no doubt. You do understand that, just as though you say, you know, I get the interp- I understand that 
when uh, the Bible says Jesus isn't going to lay on the throne of David, that that's a literal fulfillment also. You've just done kind of the same thing with this Satan being bound. Okay, well, Jesus says, can you, when, can you enter him? Let, let me say interest- this, and I, I, I believe you, but I love okay. you a lot, Pastor Jim. You do a great, great job. But on this issue, I think you, you've given up ground. It says, um, really, in, in any, um, well, you just read it, he, he'll, be, he'll be bound so he can deceive the nations no more. Right. And yet Paul warns us about him deceiving us. And, and um, you know, getting a hold of us, These, that's not what's happening there. Um, in Acts 1-8, oh, let, me just, just, let me just get back to what I was saying, because we both know the Scriptures, and we both could argue them. So I was trying just to say, first of all, that it's not a new concept. It's been held to 2,000 years, you know, bumping in and out here. Um, but I think even more clearly defined, at least, the most important doctrines of dispensationalism and even Calvinism. Um, the second thing is, as we watch God work in this world, it becomes increasingly aware to me uh, this whole idea of a, of a one-world government. Does it, let me just ask you, does that do anything to you? No. Mark of the Beast type I, thing? No. The Mark of the Beast, you have to understand... it. It says in the book of Revelation that the saints had a seal on their forehead also. you got to understand, you can't take the most symbolic ver- uh, book of Scripture and force some literal interpretation on the symbols that are given. If you say that the mark of the beast has to be some real mark put on people, then you have to say that the saints have a seal on their forehead. I don't know anybody that believes that. What I was going to okay. say a few minutes ago is that Jesus himself confirms the binding of Satan when he says... You cannot enter a strong man's house unless you first bind him. He says, if you see me casting out demons by the finger of God, then you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus confirms my interpretation of Revelation chapter 20. Hey, we've got four other callers waiting behind you, uh, Anthony. All right, man. Do me a favor, though. Send me those quotes. I'd like to take a look at them. I sure will, man. God bless you. All right, you too. Take care, Pastor Gene. You too. Okay, let's go to uh, Dustin calling from North Carolina. Dustin, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Good evening, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing all right, man. How about you? Great. Good. You getting your hackles up? Uh, I was leaning forward in my chair. (laughs) You better check the uh, leather on the chair and make sure it's still there, brother. It's heating up. (laughs) No, I don't think there's going to be a temple. Absolutely not. Why not? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we are bringing spiritual sacrifices right now, mm-hmm. according to First Peter chapter 2 mm-hmm. and Romans chapter 12, and I believe that we are the priests that are mentioned um, in several of the Old Testament passages, that that is fulfilled in the millennium. It's but being does the fulfilled now, t- but it's being fulfilled in the millennium. But I believe the millennium is not a literal thousand-year reign. I don't believe Christ's reign is limited to a thousand years. Um, a literal thousand years. Right. I believe that um, the majority of the book of Revelation was fulfilled um, before 70 A.D. And there's a couple reasons I believe that. Number one, uh, the Bible says in Joshua 21, 43 through 45, So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and no one, not one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave them all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Mm-hmm. Now that could not be more clear. I, I agree. You're not going to get an argument out of me. But does the Bible teach in the New Testament that we are priests? I mean, you make that charge. Where does the Bible teach that? <clears throat> well, um, we have, let me pull my Bible works up here. Uh, yep, we've got an open line, too, if you'd like to get in at 1-800-466-1873. We might have to go beyond 60 minutes tonight because uh, this is a good topic. Uh, we've got First Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. And then, of course, we are Abraham's seed, Galatians 3.29. So if we're, um, if we're priests, Romans, if the ahead, Bible brother. calls us priests, and we're offering spiritual sacrifices, 
Yeah, Romans chapter 12. It seems to be inconceivable that God and his plan is now going to revert to plan A, if I can put it that way, to a physical brick temple with a priesthood yeah. that are not Christians. Right. They have to be unbelievers. Right. And uh, offering sacrifices. Yeah, that that's highly problematic. I mean, it, it, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if, if we have to say that um, the physical land of Israel, the temple, and all of those things um, are still yet to be fulfilled, why in the world in Acts chapter 4 were the Jews, in order to fund the, the work of the ministry in the early church, why were the Jews, who were owners of land or houses, selling those things and bringing the proceeds of those sales and laying that at the apostles' feet? I mean, if the land is that important, why were they selling their land they were no giving telling it up. who? They were giving up land. Yeah, Acts chapter 4, verse 34 and 35. The, now, the dispensational-oriented Bible, not, and the only reason I know this because I've studied this this past week. I've been doing some study on this. The dispensational-oriented Bible knowledge commentary states um, that they sold their goods. But that's not what the text says. The text says they sold their land and their houses, and they took the proceeds of the sale and laid them at the apostles' feet. Mm -hmm. Christ said, I mean, the focus of the temple in the Olivet Discourse is the destruction of it. Exactly. Jesus is a focal point of history, not dirt, land, stone, bricks, or Jewish blood. Nothing in the New Testament talks about the rebuilding of, of the temple or going back to the land. Uh, the only thing that's mentioned is Revelation chapter 11, where John is told to measure the temple, and it says that the, that the holy city will be, assault under, uh, under, uh, will be under assault for 42 months. Now, I did some study on that. And the length of that time, 1,260 days, that it matches exactly the duration of the Jewish war, which started in February of AD 67 when uh, Vespasian the general entered the Jewish territory, and then he engaged in battle until um, April of 70 AD. That's exactly, or August of 70 AD, that's exactly 42 months. Mm. I take it you got that book in the mail. Yeah, I've been working on that a little bit. <laughs> Before Jerusalem fell, is that you want, the, the one you're reading? I got that one, and I got um, Last Day's Madness by, by DeMar. You know, that Last Day's Madness was the first one that rocked my world. Yeah, that, I couldn't put, I can't put it down. It's, it's very, very good. Be careful, though, because DeMar goes farther than I, you know, obviously yeah. DeMar is a lot more knowledgeable on this subject, but I just think he goes farther than he needs to in his partial preterism. Um, right, right. But uh, having said that, we've got some other callers waiting. It's good okay. to talk to you again, Dustin. God bless, bro. All right. Take uh, care. Let's go to uh, Trey, Pastor Trey, calling from... Are you in uh, West Virginia, Pastor Trey? It's not West Virginia. It's it's the western part of the state of Virginia. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to remember. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good to talk to you, brother. You too, brother. What's going on? I, I, well, not much. Not much. Just been ministering around this evening and... Uh, um, I remembered the uh, call in, and I uh, should have called in earlier, but uh, just a lot said and a lot to say. Man, we could talk about all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. You might have to do another show on this. I haven't even got, I haven't <laughs> got, even got to my scriptures. I've got all stacked up here. <laughs> you just might have to then. No, um, you know, I, we could talk all kinds of things. Um, you know, I could mention, for instance, you know, I was thinking when you were talking to Anthony there about... Uh, Jesus saying that he had to bind the strong man, and you, you quoted that, of course, from Mark. And uh, It's a very important passage, understanding the, the, the binding of Satan. But, you know, we could, we could talk about how the promises to Israel have been fulfilled already, like Dustin did. And, um, you know, I could, you know, show you in, in, in Romans 11 how uh, Paul says there in the first few verses of Romans 11 that it's through... Um, through the elect from Israel, through the elect remnant, just like it was in the days of Elijah, um, that uh, that God's promise is fulfilled, His covenant promise is fulfilled to the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. and that He is a covenant-keeping God, because there are Jews, ethnic Jews, of people of the covenant, who actually believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul uses himself as an example right. there exactly. in, in Romans, that to prove that God was... Uh, he says, "I myself am the tribe of Benjamin, and and you know that he's a that he's a Jew. That you, so he he proves that that God's faithful to His covenant and has fulfilled it in in its fullest terms. 
Um, but then, of course, he goes on to say how, ex- how Israel has been expanded and how it's been grafted in, mm-hmm. and that it's through that grafting in process that all the true Israel is going to be saved, um, you know, the expansion of Israel. So, of course, we could go to... Very well mentioned. put, my amillennial brother. <laughs> Uh, but you know, we could. I could. I could go to uh, Acts 15. You mentioned the Synod of Jerusalem. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The first General Assembly. You know. Yeah, let's read because <laughs> because this is this. Yeah, the first General Assembly. This is the only place where I find a, a rebuilt temple. That that it, the rebuilt tabernacle, That's the rebuilt tents of David, is, as uh, as uh, as James says there. You want to read uh, that? Yeah, sure. Um, Acts chapter 15. Uh, let's see. Verse, verse 16. Two? Verse 16, yeah, he was, uh, you know, James is talking here, he says, the words of the prophets are, are in agreement with this, as it is written, after this I will return and rebuild, rebuild David's fallen tents, its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that we, that have been known for ages. And James says, you know, it's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from uh, food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. In other words, James is saying, the fulfillment of, of that text in Amos, chapter 9, that's that what he's quoting from, the fulfillment of that text is right now in the church when the Gentiles are coming in. That's the, right. fact that, the fact that the church exists is the rebuilt tents of David. It That's is right. the kingdom of Israel. It is the restoration of the kingdom. Now, and I think, you know, just to, you know, be more on point, though, um, you know, I could, I could show you the parable there in, uh, in Matthew 21, an important parable uh, when it comes to how, how God is going to treat the nation of Israel. He says in Matthew 21, 23, and he, um, or rather... Um, rather, 33. He talks about the, the parable of the tenants and how uh, he tells this story about a man who owns a vineyard and how he uh-huh. rents it out to different uh, tenants. And, but he goes and he wants his wage from them, but, the, but they're not willing to give them the fruit. And so he sends all these messengers and his servants, and they beat them and they kill them and they strangle them and they do all these things. But finally he sends his son, and he treats his son the same way. They kill him because he's the heir. And he says, at the, at the very end, uh, Jesus says, have you, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in his eyes. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. And the chief priests and the Pharisees that heard the parable, they knew he was talking about them. Wow. That... that I don't know how you can say that the, that, that the promises that God has given, that the nation of Israel as an ethnic people, as an unbelieving people, worst of all, are still God's people, they're still his chosen people, and he's still planning to do anything. But I think more, you know, more to the point about the, the temple, though, Jesus himself said, John 2, um, you know, they were, they were there for the, for the feast, and um, it probably happened toward the end of his ministry. It's recounted in, in other Gospels at the end of his ministry. John puts it at the beginning not necessarily chronological, but it goes with the flow of his, 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 um, his narrative. Uh, but he talks about how Jesus cleared the temple. And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. That's right. And, uh, and the Jews said, well, it's taken 46 years to build the temple the way it is now. How are you going to raise it in three days? But John says the temple he spoke of was his body, the temple of his body. Now, if you read what, if you read what Paul says... You read what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. After we go on about how, uh, how we're, we're dead in sins and trespasses and how it was only God who, who granted us life by, by quickening us by his spirit and, and changing us from objects of wrath to objects of love and fellowship. Mm-hmm. And he, then he explains how we're one in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gentiles who were once aliens and strangers to the covenants of promise uh, and the Jews who were once the ones on the inside he says, now the barrier wall has been broken down. Now, if you understand, in the old temple, there was a barrier wall between the outer court and the inner court. Mm-hmm. The Gentiles were cut off from the inner court. They couldn't come into the fellowship of the inner court. That's and right. worse than that, even the Jews who could come into the inner court had, the, had the, the curtain to separate the Holy of Holies, and none of them could go into the Holy of Holies. 
uh, even the even, only the high priest and only once a year could go into the holy of holies into the God's very presence. Mm-hmm. But Paul says that the that the barrier wall has been destroyed, the dividing wall of hostility by destroying in His flesh, in the Lord Jesus Christ's flesh, the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new man out of two, that is, the Jews and the Gentiles, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And then he goes on to say, consequently, you Gentiles in Ephesus are no longer foreigners and aliens like you were under the old administration, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. And he goes on to say, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, that is, in his body, in this whole, the whole book of Ephesians is about the church. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a, tw- a dwelling place in which God lives by his Spirit. Yeah, yeah I believe That's in a good, rebuilt man. temple. That's good I, I, believe, I believe the rebuilt temple is, is, is standing right now. We're, we are, as the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rebuilt temple. We're the body of Christ. We're the body that he raised up on the third day. That's right. Um, That's you know, right. I, could, I could go over into Chronicles where, where Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, he said, we know that you don't dwell in temples made by hands of men, but we're asking you to bless what we're doing here. And Paul makes the same point when he's preaching on the, on, on, you know, the mountain Athens to the Areopagus. And he says... God doesn't dwell in temples made by, by the hands of men. And so, I mean, I don't understand why we're expecting, or anyone would expect that God would rebuild a building when he has a building right now that's being raised up, that's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone and the head of the building. And it's the church. It's the church. It's all about the church. It's all, it's all about the church. And that's the whole that's the, the biggest thing I think is wrong with dispensationalism. It wants to treat the church like a second-class citizen. It wants to treat Israel like it's the, it's the favored child. And there, there are no favored children in God's kingdom. We're all equal in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no, the Jew's not better than the Gentile, but if dispensationalists had their way, they, they would be. Mm. I, it, it, it completely circumvents what Paul says in Ephesians 2, that we're one in Christ and that we're equal, and there's no more dividing wall and no more hostility. There's no more separation. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing anymore. So the uh, the temple of the Old Testament was really uh, a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Absolutely, like the whole law was. It was to point to the reality of everything that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those sacrifices and everything were to point to Christ and what he would do. And now we have a sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It's a very simple sacrament. It's just plain uh, but it's the it's 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 a memorial. It's a it's a testimony of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done to put an end to all those other sacrifices. And uh, we don't need sacrifices. We have the one true sacrifice. We don't need a temple in which to sacrifice because we are the temple in which Preach we it, brother. we make true and living sacrifices as priests unto God, as Dustin said already. Hey, that's good stuff, man. Hey, I'm going out to uh, to see. Uh, the brothers in East Africa next week. Oh, really? Yeah, on the 29th of March, I'll be leaving. So uh, I talked to Gregory today. They're actually pouring the concrete uh, for the church building. Well, I, we'll be I praying for I you and your travels. You. Yeah. And... I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, let's get to these other callers, brother. Good talking All to right. you. All right, appreciate it. Okay, let's go to Sam calling from uh, Chicago. Sam, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Hey, Pastor Gene. How you doing, brother? Good, good to talk to you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to call just for your comments on... Uh, uh, Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5, um, just to preface it so you understand what I'm asking. Okay. Uh, in Zechariah 14, Zechariah sees the Lord God Almighty coming with the Holy Ones, and he says that his feet touches the Mount of Olives and splits it in half. And that's in reference to Yahweh coming to fight against the nations whom he has gathered to destroy Jerusalem. Now, Zechariah 14 goes hand in hand with Zechariah 12. Um, if you read Zechariah 12, the entire chapter, it's also about the theme of the nations gathering against Jerusalem, Yahweh coming down and empowering the house of Israel to fight their enemies and defeat them. And then it says in Zechariah 12.10, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced Mm -hmm. and mourn for him as they mourn for an only son. Now, why this is relevant to your discussion is because in Acts 1, 
verses 9 to 12. Mm -hmm. um, it says that when Jesus ascended before the apostles, and a cloud hid him, uh, hid him bef uh, from uh, the apostles, the two angels, the two men in white that were there, saying that this Jesus will return the same way that you saw him ascend. And if you read Acts 1, verses 9 to 12, you'll note there that Jesus will ascend it from the Mount of Olives, which means that he'll return to the Mount of Olives. So that's, he's returning there, if we take what the angels are saying. Yeah. Well, it says in the same manner, right? It doesn't say in the same... Uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with that happening, but it says in the same manner. Well, I, I would understand the same manner, meaning the way you see him ascend in front of you and the cloud hiding him is the way he'll return. Yeah. Uh, and if I take that as a cross-reference to Zechariah 14, Yahweh's feet descending, so then I take that literally, that the feet that Zechariah is seeing is not a metaphorical description, but he's seeing the glorified Christ as the Lord God coming with his holy ones. Right. Especially if you take that with 1 Thessalonians 3.13, because in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Paul says that the Lord Jesus will come with the Holy Ones. Yes, that's true. Now, my, my point in bringing that up is because um, I've heard Gary DeMar explain Zechariah 12 in connection to what happened during the days of Esther, Esther mm -hmm. when uh, the decree went out that the people would slaughter the Jews mm -hmm. at the instigation of Haman, right? Mm -hmm. Haman. Right, Haman, yeah. And then God gave them a great victory because then uh, the king of Persia gave them the decree to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when they defended themselves, they fought their enemies and won. And then he says that Zechariah 12.10 was fulfilled according to John 19.37 in reference to Christ's crucifixion because John quotes it and says this was to fulfill what the scripture says, you know, they should look upon the one they've pierced. Mm -hmm. And then on Pentecost, 3,000 were convicted and mourned at the heart and repented. So Gary DeMar says that that was fulfilled all during that moment, these events in Zechariah 12, 14, so forth. You following what? Yeah. What, okay. Now, the problem I had with that position, and I brought it to Gary DeMar, and at that time he said he'd get back to me, is that according to Revelation 1, 7, Zechariah 12, 10 was not fulfilled on the day of Pentecost because Revelation 1, 7 applies Zechariah 12, 10 to a future event. That's what I'm looking at. I, I'm actually reading that verse while you're talking. Yeah, see, so my point is, when 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 was this when is this going to be fulfilled when uh, Zechariah 12 and 14 it's in reference to Yahweh coming and fighting against the enemies of Jerusalem and Revelation 1 7 says it didn't happen on Pentecost nor is uh, nor did the ultimate fulfillment of it happen on the cross now the cross is when he was crucified but the fulfillment of the people mourning uh, when they look at the one who's pierced which in Zechariah 12 and 14 is in reference to Yahweh coming and battling the nations was still a future event from the perspective of the writing of Revelation. And I'm not saying Revelation is referring to the end times. What I want clarification from your position is, when will this be fulfilled if John sees Zechariah 12.10, which speaks of Yahweh coming and fighting the nations uh, who come up against Jerusalem, in reference to Christ when he comes on the clouds, uh, that's when they will realize that they've pierced him and they'll mourn because of it, because according to Gary DeMar, he tried to connect it with the events of Esther, but uh, John says clearly that's not, that's not its fulfillment. So when will this be fulfilled? Well, I think it was fulfilled in 70 A.D., and I think that the scripture in John 19.37 yes. isn't uh, referencing the fact that the tribes of the earth are mourning, but it's referencing the fact that this is the manner in which he's pierced. So I think what John is saying here is, look, scripture talked about, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Mm -hmm. This is why, because he was he was crucified. Yep. Okay, so that's yep. my take on John nineteen thirty seven. The uh, Revelation one seven, yeah. um, I think happened actually. In fact, if you look in in my uh, in my we we talked about this once before. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Yep. Uh, from exactly. Yeah, that I saw. Yeah. So I would say that. Revelation 1-7 was fulfilled at 70 A.D. Um, and this morning here is not a morning of repentance. No, I agree. I don't see that as a morning of repentance it's, as it's well. A wailing of, uh, it's a wailing of actual um, fear. It's a different type of mourning. Now, it's been a while since I've studied this passage, but uh, I'm recalling in my notes there, this is an extreme type of emotional um, uh, dis distress here. But I would have to go back. But I can say I can say pretty confidently that I think that John 9, 30, 1937 is referring to the manner in which he was pierced. Yeah, I agree with that. Revelation 1-7 is referring. Now, as far as Zechariah 12-10. Yeah, 
Yeah, that wasn't my point. Just my my point is not uh, so far that you believe that it refers to 70 A.D., but how does that reconcile with the application of Zechariah 12 and 14 when the the morning of the pierced one is when he comes to the Mount of Olives to fight against the nations that gather against Jerusalem? Right. That's, That's uh, my problem. That's where I'm having a difficulty. Yeah, and and I'm not prepared right now to, to give a... Uh... Okay, that's fine, but can you look into that for me? I will. I'll look at it this week. Yeah, and then maybe you can discuss it in a future program there, because that's one that troubled me, and uh, because I'm trying, because I, I embrace a lot of partial preterism, uh-huh. a lot of it, and I do believe that a lot of uh, what Revelation saying is referring to 70 AD as well as Matthew 24, but I still see Zechariah 12 and 14 as difficult for me to completely say that those passages of Scripture referring to Christ's first coming and uh, 70 AD. So if you can look into that and maybe discuss that on your program, you'd be doing me a favor. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I wrote that down, so I will definitely take a look at that and possibly do a program on it. I appreciate it, brother. Uh, it's a difficult... Uh, I'm telling you, this this whole thing is it's very complex. Uh, <laughs> you ain't kidding. <laughs> it's not something you can just sit down and sort out in a matter of a few hours. No, uh, believe me, I've been I've lost more hair follicles because of this. <laughs> good. All right. That's, that's a good sign. Uh, good talking to you, Sam. Thank you, brother. Okay, let's go to uh, Shane calling from uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. Shane, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Hey, Gene, how's it going, brother? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good, man. It's some heavy stuff here. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, well, a few few callers back just about um, already said what what most of uh, what I agree with about Christ being the tabernacle who dwelt among us, and and, uh, he was uh, the fulfillment of the temple. Um, and dispensational is having a fixation on the types and shadows rather than the object of the types and shadows. But um, with that said, I get hung up on, I see a tension because I get hung up on on uh, Romans 11. Um, and my summary of it is, uh, in order to make the Jews jealous, he broke them off, gave them a spirit of stupor and eyes to see not. Mm-hmm. And he opened um, opened up the covenant for uh, for Gentiles. Mm-hmm. And where I get really hung up is is around verse twenty five. Um, you know where he gets into that the partial hardening is has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Um, he will. Let's see. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now I'm not. I'm not supposing that all Israel will be saved is somehow necessarily an ethnic Israel. I, I would probably say that that would be Israel as a whole. Um, but that there is some tension there for me, you know, because he is referencing uh, a partial hardening has happened to Israel. So that obviously there seems to be some kind of distinction between Israel and Gentiles in in this passage. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the the usage of Israel in contrast with Gentiles is usually speaking of national Israel. Okay. Uh, Israel as a, a people group, ethnic Israel, not necessarily national Israel because they weren't a nation at the time, but uh, ethnic Israel. Okay. So he says in verse 25, now, just for the sake of our listeners, there's uh, different interpretations on this among even those that are not dispensational. For okay. example, Shane, I don't know if you if you got to listen to it, but about three or four weeks ago, I had a uh, pastor on from Jerusalem when we discussed this this text at the end of the show. Yeah, I heard it, but I, it wasn't it. Y'all, y'all didn't get too deep in it, did you? Not really. Um, but this obviously is one of the main verses that are that is held by dispensationalists to to maintain this sharp dichotomy between Israel and the Gentiles. Um, now, I don't have if if somebody wants to teach and believe that this verse is saying that there's a time in the future in which there's going to be a large number of Jews turning to Christ. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I don't know how you would know it. In fact, I don't even know how anybody knows that they're a Jew today. I'm going to I'm going to uh, surprise a lot of people by saying that, because all of the genealogical records were destroyed in 70 A.D. Uh, so nobody even knows what tribe they're from. 
And the, the rabbis changed. It used to be that a Jew was one who had a Jewish father. The rabbis changed that to the mother uh, because I was just discussing this with Dr. Bob Morey because they couldn't really prove who the father was. So if you talk to a Jew today, nobody knows what tribe they're from. Well, if they don't know what tribe they're from, how do they even know that they're Jewish? They've just been told that they're Jewish. So, Well, that's where, that's where I would... That's, logically, I would just think um, was... Now we know that now we know that the covenant God has kept since Abraham has always been with inward Israel, you know, yeah, or exactly. spiritual Israel. There's no argument for me on that. But um, you know that that about you saying how would anyone know that they're a Jew? Would you be saying Jew would be defined as um, those who would fall under like God's theocracy? No, I would define try to that. keep the Mosaic Law and, and the, no, I would define that as I'm talking about ethnically Jew, okay. and Jewish because Jewish. So you really wouldn't know, but you said you, you don't think there's any problem with believing that there will be um, that after all the fullness of the Gentiles come in, there will be some kind of ethnic uh, bringing back of yeah, of, the, somebody, uh, of ethnic Jews. Right, if somebody wanted to maintain that. Now, we're not talking about having a special privilege simply because right, right, right. Orthodox Jews. Well, see, that's where, that's where I, I lean towards, only because of Romans 11 is the only place where I get stuck because in no way, shape, or form will I say that uh, that an ethnic Jew is somehow chosen of God apart from Christ. Right. Well, no, you know, no but, but, it, it, I just can't run away from Romans 11, where there seems like there's absolutely a distinction between both, and we ought to praise God that they were hardened so that we could come in, you know. But it seems like once we come in, you know, there's going to be uh, a ton of Jews that come in through Christ just like we did. Unless, unless what Paul is saying here, is that the manner in which all Israel is saved is the incorporation of the Gentiles. True. Because back in, remember Romans chapter 9? Oh, yeah. He's making the argument that one is not a Jew. Well, he starts out in chapter 2 of saying one is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but a Jew is one who is one inwardly. Right. And then in Romans chapter 9, he says um, in verse... Uh, six, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Right. So he's basically been saying all along, look, it's not enough just to be to, to be ethnically Israel. You have it. You have to be a child of the promise. That's the argument that he makes in Romans chapter nine. So for him to go back and now argue about some blessing for ethnic identity, really, it goes uh, counter counterclockwise to what he's been saying. It's counterproductive to what he's been saying. Mm -hmm. So I think what he's saying here is what Trey said earlier kind of quickly, and, and I happen to catch it. I don't know if anybody else caught it. But um, the manner in which all Israel is saved is that God brings the Gentiles into the olive tree, into the olive tree, along with the roots of the natural roots, those that are believing in in uh, Jesus that are, are Jewish, that are Israelites. And also, he's grafting them back in. The ones that he broke off, he's uh -huh. also in the process of grafting them back in. So I would say, look, there's. I don't think that this verse teaches us that there's this dichotomy between um, favored Israelites and the Gentile church. People say, well, there's three, three, dispensationalists say there's three groups of people. If you don't recognize these three groups of people, then everything's going to be screwed up. You've got the church, you've got Israel, and you've got Gentiles. And they, they, they use that, or they say that, because all three of those groups are, met, are mentioned. The church consists of Israel and Gentiles. Uh, yeah. Israel consists of unbelieving, in that sense, if it's in contrast to the church, unbelievers, and, Genti and Gentiles not in the in the uh, context of the church are unbelieving gentiles so you got unbelieving gentiles unbelieving jews and the church which consists of believing jews and gentiles right so i so think what, do, well, what do we do with with verse 23 and 24 because you know those two verses seem to, to segue into the distinction 
uh, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. That's right. For if you were cut off what, from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So, as long I mean, as, I, as long as people understand, if, if somebody wants to say that this is talking about a large number of Jews... Uh, coming to Jesus Christ and uh, being grafted in by faith. I don't have a problem with that, whether they're dispensational or postmillennial. Um, what I do have a problem with is saying that Jews, by the very virtue of being Jewish, are God's chosen people when they are born enemies of God, when they live as enemies of God, and they die of enemies of God. There's no, there's no, that, that is not what it means to be a chosen person. That is not to be that is not what it means to be a child of the promise, okay? So the only blessings of the promises are found in Christ. That's so what would the position, I mean, you, you see the tension in Romans 11 too, right? Well, I mean, you see the tension, I'm not saying yeah, it's not, it's not their an interpretation easy is no, that it's not an easy it, somehow passage. we're going to go back to the types and shadows to fulfill this, because, you know, I, I'll fight and stand with you on that one. But is there a position that says, you know, there will be a, a, a repentance of ethnic Israel that God intended to come back? Um, and, and don't don't like I think I've heard Piper say that too. He thinks the seven thousand have not bowed the knee to Baal. You know. Yeah, but, but if they haven't, would there bowed be the a knee, position for that? If there's that... there seven thousand right now that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, then they're Christians because if they're not Christians, they're bowing the knee to Baal. Right. An Orthodox Jew is no closer to God than a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Buddhist. It's that simple. It, Christ is the only way to the Father, right. and when Christ comes and reveals Himself of the God of, as the God of Abraham and Jacob, and they reject that God they are rejecting the only God that exists. And they fabricate other gods uh, through their false interpretation of the Old Testament, the commentaries of the Mishnah and the Talmud and all those other commentaries that they base their beliefs on. And it has nothing to do with Scripture. Shane, we're out of time. Good talking to you, brother. Um, I do want to uh, tell both Shane and Anthony and uh, anyone else that's listening, I'm going to be in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area on business around uh, April 15th, sometime between most likely April 15th and April 20th. And uh, I would love to get together with you guys, go out to dinner, uh, especially Anthony, meet Anthony and Shane. And even uh, Derek Sansone, our atheist friend, Zach Moore, anybody else that lives out there uh, that listens to the program. So do me a favor and send me an email so that we can all meet somewhere for dinner. And um, you guys can buy my dinner and we'll have a great time. (laughs) Maybe we'll go to Three Forks. Actually, that's where I went last time I was there. It was great. Uh, The food was really good. All right, folks, you've been listening to uh, The Narrow Mind. My name is Gene Cook, and may the Lord continue to bless the study of his word. Until next week.